There's a story about a Zen monk. A lot of these spiritual stories are about Zen monks. And um, this is a pretty famous story. You've probably heard it before. <clears throat> and the um, Zen monk is going through the jungle one day. And uh, he starts to get chased by a tiger. And the tiger chases him all the way through the jungle. And um, eventually he runs through the jungle and he sees a clearing ahead. It's great, runs for the clearing. Then when he gets to the clearing, he realizes it's actually a cliff. So he's standing at the edge of the cliff. There's a tiger chasing him behind him, coming up behind him fast. So he um, doesn't know what to do. And then he sees a rope, rope going down the side of the cliff. And he goes, great. And he starts to climb down the rope. So the tiger reaches the top of the cliff and he's all snarling and frustrated that he can't um, get him because the monk is going down the, the rope now. But uh, he he's uh, very determined and so he uh, just hangs around at the top of the rope waiting. So the monk is looking up and he can see the tiger looking down at him, ready to get him. And, he thinks, oh, phew. and then um, as he's, it's a big cliff, it's a long cliff. So he's, uh, he's about halfway down. And um, he sort of, as he's been climbing down, the roars of the tiger up at the top of the cliff have been getting more, you know, quieter as he gets further away from them. But then he notices that they're actually starting to get louder again. And then he looks down and there's three tigers at the bottom of the rope. So he's, he can't go up and he can't go down. He's kind of stuck. And he's like, ah, oh, crap, what am I going to do? Well, I don't know if he'd say that, but... Anyway, something along those lines, the uh, Zen monk equivalent of, of, oh shit, what am I going to do? Um, so, while he's thinking about that, he, um, he, he looks back up the, the rope and he sees that uh, a little mouse has uh, crawled down the rope and he's about um, halfway between him and the monk and uh, he's chewing on the rope. So, not only is um, the tiger at the very top, there's a mouse uh, very you know near enough to the tiger chewing on the rope. Uh, he won't be able to get it back up in time before the, the rope is chewed th through. Um, and and, uh, and then this tiger is down below, so he can't go up, he can't go down, and the, the mouse is chewing through the rope. So he's basically screwed. And uh, while he's looking up and he's looking down, and he, he straight in front of him, he notices a um, strawberry. Strawberries are growing out of the cliff. Um, I don't know what kind of jungle he would be in for that to be happening. I don't really know enough about plants to uh, comment, but it sounds a bit strange. But anyway, strawberries growing in front of him on this cliff. So um, he reaches out and he's, he can reach the, the strawberry. So he, he um, grabs a strawberry and he um, bites into it. And it is the most uh, beautiful strawberry he's ever had in his whole life. And that's the end of the story. <laughs> And um, the, the point of the story is about living in the moment, about living in the now. And that even though he's got, uh, you know, a tiger above and tigers below and the mouse is eating through the rope, he's, in, he's present enough to appreciate that this is the most beautiful strawberry he's um, ever tasted in his whole life. Um, so apart from appreciating the uh, beauty of that and the poetry, really, of that uh, old story, um, the other thing that, that kind of struck me about it was that he's one really unlucky monk. I mean, Jesus, you know, to have all those, that's a, that's a real, like, perfect storm of bad shit to happen to you all at the same time. Tigers above, tigers below. You could kind of go, okay, well, maybe there's just tigers in the jungle. But then you have this mouse that's eaten through the, the very rope that you need to stay. You know, that's one unlucky monk. That, that was my take on it, uh, anyway. I think that's the thing about uh, those kind of stories and about... About spiritual stuff and reading about, you know, monks. I mean, there's another story about, um, it's about uh, this monk who was, uh, I used to tell this for uh, craniosacral therapists, uh, tra when I was tra tra in training craniosacral therapists, it, 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 this story would come up. And it's about, um, it's like four guys trying to shift this, ho this boulder, huge boulder. It's in the road. Um, I don't know how it got into the road. It must have rolled down the hill. Let's say that. It rolled down the hill, and that's how the boulder is in the, uh, is in the middle of the road. Anyway, the, the four guys are all struggling around this boulder trying to, to move it, and they're exhausted. They're all, like, flat on their back, 
wrecked from four hours of trying to shift this boulder. They've put things under it to pry it up, hasn't worked. So they're just exhausted. Anyway, along comes the Zen monk. It's probably a different one. It would have to be a different one. In fact, this was a, I think these guy, this guy was a Japanese guy. Uh, I think he was a master, blah, 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 blah. So, you know, I'm sure if you know this story, you can uh, fill in the details and you can let me know who, who it is I'm actually talking about. But anyway, master, blah, blah, Zen guy comes down the road and um, he uh, walks around the rock and uh, asks the guys, do you need a hand? And they're like, sure, yeah, okay, whatever, um, if you want to. And uh, so he, he, um, he uh, as I say, walks around, looks at the rock, and then he sort of puts his hands on both sides of the rock and just moves it out of the way. And the four guys are speechless. They can't believe. They're like, is this guy super, because he has superhuman powers, or how did he do that? Yeah. And they say, well, how did you do that, Master Zen, whatever his name is? And uh, he said, um, well, I looked around the rock and I, I uh, wanted to, I, I figured out, or not I figured out, but I could see, that's it, I could see which way the rock wanted to go. And uh, that's a very uh, useful <laughs> story for uh, craniopsychotherapists therapists because uh, cr craniopsychotherapists therapists are, uh, they palpate the person's body and they, uh, they're trying to get a sense of uh, what the person is trying to release and then they're trying to get a sense of what direction it's it's going and if you you know can figure that out you know amazing things can happen when the rock goes in the right way and that's great and everything and those kind of stories are um, useful to a point but where they become unuseful is um, when you kind of you know if you're learning craniopsychotherapy and you you know you you feel like one of the four guys struggling around this this thing that you can't move um, then the story, if you use the story to kind of go, well, what the fuck is wrong with me that I can't get this bloody thing to move, uh, the, or can't even hear it and get a sense of, you know, where it's going, or if you, uh, you know, you've got the bank manager is the tiger above you, uh, you know, ringing you, and below you you've got uh, other creditors, uh, the credit card company, um, the store card company, um, and then um, your landlord uh, rings you and tells you you're going to be evicted, and he's the little mouse cutting through the rope, going back to the other story, uh, you know, and you've got all this going on, and you, you know, you, you see something beautiful, you see a flower maybe, or a lovely sunset, and you just can't appreciate it. If you know about this story, then you'll be like, well, what's wrong with me? I can't, you know, I'm not like that monk. I can't appreciate the, the most beautiful strawberry I've ever tasted in my life. I can't live in the now. I can't be, I can't be present because I've got all this other stuff going on. <clears throat> um, so those stories are, it's a bit, it's like a celebrity um, and it's like gurus and masters and all this kind of thing. And this thing that we do um, of using other people's experience to separate ourselves from uh, our own experience. So, oh, I can't be like that Zen monk. Uh, I can't be... Um, I should be a different way. There should be some other way I should be. Because there's that other person, and they're that way. He was able to appreciate that strawberry, or he was able to move that rock. And why can't I? Why can't I be like that? What the fuck is wrong with me? And then it's like... It's, it's, it's pointless. It's, it's, it's not... It's not pointless. It's like, well, what, there was no point. There's no point in telling that story to, to uh, anybody. Um, but the power, the desire, our, our desire to do this is very strong. I saw it um, like when I used to teach craniopsychotherapy therapy in classes. Yeah, because the way I was taught craniopsychotherapy therapy was in a classroom. Like like a lot of things. You have a teacher. They'd stand up in front of the, the class. And craniopsychotherapy therapy has the potential to look like, you know, some sort of special powers when you've got a lot of experience. Um, because you can palpate things in a, in a person's body. And it seems like, my God, how did you do that? Uh, now, I know you, you, how you do that is through uh, a lot of practice and a lot of skill. And um, it's, it's a learned uh, thing. It's not a... I mean... It's, an, it's not a, an innate uh, thing. So I would say all this, and I would say, you know, oh, I can palpate all this sort of stuff um, in this particular person's body, but that's just because I've practiced um, for a long time. Um, there's nothing special about me. I don't have any special powers, and if you practice, you will be able to do this as well. wouldn't matter that I'd said that, 
people would still project this thing of like, no, no, it's all right for you. You're kind of special. You can you can feel things in a person's body that only you know I couldn't do. I can't do that. You know, and it's it was pretty shocking to sort of see the way people um, use that disempower dis that thing of no your that person is has got their act together and i i haven't you think that in the whole spiritual uh, world where you're talking about things like uh, ego and non-attachment and seeing through the illusion you think that kind of thing wouldn't go on and the idea like of spiritual jealousy or spiritual um superiority or spiritual uh, you know um ego i suppose you could call it seems like counter contradictory but it's it's not it goes on our spiritual one-upmanship you know i'm holier than you you know that all that kind of stuff that all goes on as well but um i think that's where the whole guru uh thing came from and i think it was probably necessary as a point of uh as part of evolution uh, of consciousness or growth possibly but it certainly isn't anymore it certainly there's no need for gurus anymore as far as i can see um, because it's just getting in the way, and the idea of uh, people, um, the, the, this, it's, it's very similar to c celebrity, like the, 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 the way celebrity has gone, like we used to have royalty back in history, if, you know, if history is real, which I don't know if it's real, <coughs> but let's, say, let's just say it is for the story of it, we had royalty, now we have um, film stars and rock stars and rap artists and you know, people who don't do anything, but they're celebrities. Uh, they don't have any skill or contribution or whatever. I mean, they do their, their skill is being able to become a celebrity. Because it's not easy to become a celebrity. Uh, you have to work at it. You have to show up. You have to hire a PR person. You have to have nowhere to show up and who to be seen with and all that kind of thing. So, you know, it's not completely skillless. But I'm um, just, you know, compared to people who um, are singers or dancers or... Uh, filmmakers or f actors or you know something that does require skill um, and then in the in the um, spiritual world you've got people who are gurus like I'm 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 really wise you should all come and listen to me read my book buy, listen to my tapes subscribe to my TV channel whatever it is um, but I think if you if you've got the whole spiritual inquiry thing and that kind of thing interests you, if it doesn't interest you, then you probably wouldn't be listening to this podcast, <laughs> anyway, unless you're a craniosacral therapist or something. But if you're if you've got that kind of spiritual inquiry thing, I know I had it, um, and I used to I used to read lots and lots of spiritual books. I'd listen to it was cassette tapes at the time for me because it was back in the sort of late eighties, early nineties listen to cassette tapes or CDs when the CDs were there, different, you know, people or, uh, yeah, you could get videos, I didn't really watch that many videos, or you'd, you know, you'd go and see people, you'd go and sit with them and this whole thing of satsang, you know, and going to sit with people and meditating together and all that kind of thing. Um, these are all things you can do, but I've found it's really simple, it's a really simple rule. If you step in front of people, okay, even if it's only two people, if you step in front of them and like, I am now going to teach you, or I'm now going to share my, you know, wisdom with you, uh, then you basically, as you, when you step in front of them, you put this barrier in front of, you, you've created a line and you've crossed it and you're basically, you're the audience and I am the speaker. Now, if that's if you're a singer or if you're a dancer or if you're a performer, well, we, that's the kind of convention. We we're the audience and you're the performer, and we're all you know going to look at you and you know that's fine. But in terms of talking about consciousness or um, enlightenment or the truth or reality or or a way of living or anything like that, um, it's it's. Um, I don't think it's thinking it through, um, and it's also that thing of well, I have to make a living. So you know, I'm really into this spiritual thing. So uh, you know, I've got to make a living. So maybe I should sell some DVDs. Maybe I should sell some books, or you know, maybe I should hold some meetings and people can come along and share in my you know spiritual perspective. And then suddenly you've got a following, and it all goes. 
but it takes and great you make a living from it or even if it's just a, you know, allows you to continue to do it it's still actually what's the point why why would why do you want to talk to people why do you want to share your um wisdom or your um whatever and you could say that about me because what the point what are you doing a, what are you doing a podcast for what what's the point and uh, it's a good question um and i i held off i held off doing uh, anything like that and for a long time. Bear in mind now, I've been enlightened since 1996, okay? So that's a long time to, to be with it. So I've had a long time to kind of... Uh, it's a long time of not saying anything about it. And um, I think, in the end, the reason I started doing a podcast... I mean, I wrote Maya Noise, which is very much about enlightenment, spirituality, my particular take on it. But, I mean, if you read it, it's full of, well, this is just my perspective. And I think that that whole thing of one person's perspective is that is just that it's just one person's perspective now because it's me and my life it's the most important perspective in the world because i only live in this body and i only have this one perspective um and i am saying it looks like everyone else has got a similar kind of deal where everyone's got their own perspective but i don't know that uh, all i know is about me and my reality the reality that i become conscious into every morning and that i become unconscious of and disappears every night when I go to sleep so from years of being enlightened and looking at my reality um, I kind of went well everybody has got saying something um, I'd I think uh, I would like to join the conversation and say what I have to say okay but there's a big difference between that and going Right, I think I'm going to fill a hall full of people. I'm going to sit up the front of them and I'm going to go tell them how it is. This is how it is. This is the truth. This is um, how to live your life. Here's how to solve every problem you can come up with. You give me. I will tell you, you know. Or you can all just sit there and I will just, give, you know, I'll just talk and talk and talk and talk. And you can all just, you know, listen to what I have to say. Now, um, this is a this is a uh, predominantly uh, a, an audio podcast. Um, I I've, I do video. Uh, I do have an accompanying video, but there, this isn't a video podcast. Okay, and I did that on purpose because um, just the nature of podcasts. I kind of liked. I like to listen to podcasts. There's certain things that um, are you can only do like um, like driving. Uh, commuting you could you could probably look at a video podcast commuting but it, there are certain things that uh, it's a bit like radio um that that lend themselves to uh audio only and um it's kind of like having a chat with somebody as you're walking along but i like podcasts because unless uh <laughs> all things being equal they'll just be me and you, whoever you are listening to this podcast, um, it won't be a collective group unless you know there's some strange group of people that all get together to listen to my podcast, <laughs> which is yeah too a bit a bit weird, and I don't really want to know about that. But you know, I'm joking. But the the, the you, you, they'll just be me and you, and we'll just be like having a chat. Now that to me is like very pure communication. Um, I've seen I've seen great things happen when there's just that and uh, you know i've had like i've had different people in in my life that have had a you know that have influenced me strongly um you know i've, I've probably i've made reference to barry long a few times in other podcasts so barry barry long in the kind of old school of you know master pupil barry long would have been my master um <clears throat> then but then um, I talk about it in May and I that I didn't become enlightened in front of Barry Long. I became enlightened in front of a woman called Catherine Ingram, who wasn't my master. And I'm doing making inverted commas here with my fingers. Um, she was somebody else, and it actually took somebody else to break this kind of um, spell. This kind of guru. Ma I mean, Barry Long used to say he was a guru, but he used to say a lot of things mainly to just not to be provocative but they were very provocative um so uh catherine ingham just kind of brought and i was only like around catherine ingham for two nights but you could say that all the stuff that i'd done before that led up to uh 
led up to it with Barry Long helped it. But then I had a very good friend uh, called uh, James um, who was who was just you know somebody that I knew in in Dublin, and um, I think it was a combination of all those those three people. But of all of them, it was James um, who helped me a lot um, because he um, because I it was just very ordinary. It was just me and him having a chat, like me and anybody else uh, having a chat. Whereas in the whole dynamic of, say, Barry Long, there was always, the, like, Barry used to do the meetings thing and have you sit up the front and all that kind of thing. And there was this huge void of, um, uh, between the, you know, audience and the master. And, um, it made it very difficult to kind of go, to find it in myself. To, you know, because there was, the way um, it, was, it was presented was a little bit like um, the way Hollywood presents things in a kind of perfection. And I'm not saying Barry did that on purpose. Maybe he did. I don't think he did. But I think my own stuff got in the way and made me and projected. I would project onto uh, Barry the way I would project onto Hollywood people or musicians or anyone who's more successful than I was and kind of gone, oh, well, you know, I can't be like that because I'm not good-looking enough, uh, clever enough, rich enough, musical enough, artist, whatever it, it was, um, that basically it just was... I used it to reinforce this idea of um, inadequacy, that there's something fundamentally wrong. And for as long as I had that gone on, I wasn't enlightened. Now... Now that, you know, I got through that and I am enlightened now, you know, and it's like I'm very careful when I talk to people about anything like this because because of that, because I don't encourage anybody else to, uh, I don't want to encourage that kind of projection uh, on me. But yet, that's not a, I find a kind of eventually got, was like, okay, well, I've been, I've been quiet now for years, you know, whatever. 96, and he started doing this this year, whatever that is. What's that? I don't know. 17 years, is it? 96, 2006. Yeah, about 30. Yeah, 17 years, yeah. Roughly. Um, 17 years of not saying anything in this kind of... To a more public... Basically, with this podcast, I'm talking to people that I don't know. I mean, whoever you are. Maybe I know you, maybe I don't. But... Uh, when I was ma when I'm doing it, I'm kind of doing it, not knowing who is going to be listening to it. Um, everything else, like it, it, up until this, if I've talked to anybody, it's just been one to one. And in that in that communication, you can see you can see me, and you can hopefully you can. It's the least amount of projection possible. Okay, um, so you can you can. Um, Whatever is of use that I'm saying, or if there's anything in my particular perspective, then you can use it, and it, I hope it, it's it's as clean as possible. I'm not saying, uh, I'm not telling anybody how to live. I'm not telling anybody how to become enlightened. Um, and even if I do drift into that, I'm saying it now. I'm not telling anyone how to do anything. What I, all I'm doing is sort of saying, well, this is what this is what it looks like from my my reality this is this is what my perspective looks like and then if if that's of help then great now i think if uh barry long or whatever particular guru i had come across in the beginning um had said and like barry long wasn't the first i, I read a lot of krishnamurti as well who i thought was very a lot of what he said spoke to me uh, and that's the see that's the danger is like I think if you've listened to enough of my podcasts, you'll you'll know like that uh, there's a lot, there's there's areas in my life that I haven't got sorted out at all. But with certainly with Barry and Christian Morty and any of those, you didn't get any of that. You just get the you know their their perspective. So the danger with the gurus is that like because somebody says something that's ninety percent the truth, ninety percent of the truth is very powerful. Uh, it can, it can, 
knock you back on your heels. It can be that powerful. Um, and the tendency is to kind of go, is to, is, is to not even notice the 10% bullshit <laughs> that's coming in with it as well. But unfortunately, it, the 10% bullshit is, the, is very um, dangerous because it can... Uh, you can you end up taking everything on board. I did anyway, and I've observed, I observed lots of people doing this as well. Uh, through you know my uh, any not just to do, not just the people who went to see Barry Long right across the spectrum. Because bear in mind, I've treated a lot of people as well, and I've treated people who've been in cults, and I've treated people who've you know who are very into the spiritual world, and they would take different shapes and different masters, and um, and this. This thing seems to be uh, right across the board. The trouble comes when the um, the ten percent or whatever percentage it is is not recognised. And I think the onus is on the person who's doing the talking to basically, if they're not saying, "Well, look, I don't know," you know, <laughs> I don't know that bit. That question you asked me, I don't really know. Or um, I still have uh, this thing, or this thing still bothers me, or I haven't got that bit figured out, or you know. It's very, as I say, when you step in front of people to say, to start giving them, you know, giving forth, then um, then you're, just by the nature of it, just by the dynamic of, I am going to now step in front of you and I am going to tell you about whatever it is, then you, you've given to that space for the person to uh, to project onto you and you're helping them not become free as far as I can see you know like Nelson Mandela died yesterday and um, everyone was you know this thing about making a difference and how important it is to make a difference I don't think making a difference makes a difference I don't think making a difference for the sake of making a difference makes that much difference I think being happy is makes a bigger difference um, I think um, being kind makes a big difference uh, I think, you know, like I've seen people on crusades about changing the world and they're like, they're being horrible to everybody around them, you know, but it's like, oh, but I'm, I'm making a difference, you know, it's, it's important. Well, I don't think anything's that important, you know, like it is a bit like coming back to that, that, um, monk, you know, not so much the strawberry thing, but like, unless those moments of this, you know, the strawberry, unless Unless they're happening, like, what's the point? Like, what's the point of, of, of being a complete shit to everybody in the process of, of changing the world and making a difference? What's the point of being miserable and being, having a very uncomfortable life? And I don't mean uncomfortable as in, um, uh, you know, that you should be all, like, your whole life should be about comfortable being comfortable and having a nice couch and a big plasma TV. I don't mean that. I mean uncomfortable in yourself. Like that there's no there's no sweetness, there's no juice in your life. It's all dry and hard and flinty because you're making a difference. To me, you know, it's like it's like people saying, you know, what about the environment? You know, people people talk about, you know, I've seen I've been around a few people who are so conscious of the environment and part of me is going well what about my fucking environment you're, you're you're ruining my environment with your bloody pious you know self-righteous bullshit like yeah of course the environment's important but jesus you know stop being a bloody so such a saint about it and and you know ruining my you know everything was sweet and pleasant until you started like sorting the bottles from the bloody plastic jesus you know can you not do that without having to ram your opinion and your judgments down my throat? You know what I'm saying. That kind of... <laughs> I, I don't say that to people, by the way, but I, it occurs to me, you know. It's like uh, political correctness. I'm, it's Of course it's right, and you don't want to... But, like, you don't want... Like, it, it's, it's almost not politically correct to be so politically correct people are like tripping over themselves like they're so paranoid C -c can I say this now can I say that thing yeah. oh okay were you allowed to say that yeah okay and the, the essence of it, instead of it being like you don't say it because you don't say a particular thing because it's it's disrespectful and it hurts people you're just saying it because you don't want to be you know you don't want to be the last person standing at the end of the musical chairs you know and falling on your arse because you're the one still saying the thing that's not politically correct to say anymore and I'm doing my <laughs> verticals again 
your treasured sacred um, cows. Everyone's got their sacred cows. Like I like, I like the Tower of Being by um, Ray Grigg is the guy's name. Um, I'll put a link in the show notes. Um, now there's lots of translations of the Tao Te Ching, but I just like this one. So I think it's the combination of I like this guy Ray Grigg and the way he's translated the Tao Te Ching. And it's called the Tao of Being. Really like it. It's only it's the book. It's the I, I think I first read it in 1988, nine something like that. And I've always had a copy of it since, and I continually refer back to it. And it's continually I see new things in it every time I go back to it. Not like I read it every day, but I I, I regularly return to it. So that you could say that's one of my sacred cows. Oh well, it's not really, but I could. Yeah, you know, I'm just using it as an example of something that I know, where you kind of go, oh, that's that's you know that's really wise. You know, Buddha. People, a lot of people like Buddha. Um, a lot of people like their own particular master or guru. Or a lot of people. I've been doing a lot, quite a bit of yoga over the last couple of years, so the yoga people are very into the particular different things. There's all this kind of Indian. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a. There's a Betting guy, a lot of people like at the moment, or said the Dalai Lama. Everybody loves the Dalai Lama. So you can, you know, all these kind of things. Ha- have they become your sacred cow? What is, you know, what have you got that was like, no, that's unassailable? Meaning, I could never be that person. If you've got anybody who's like, I could never be that person, then I think that will keep you. You'll always be. You won't be free. I don't think it would be free. I can't see... There's nobody like that I can think of who I can't, I can't be that person. Obviously, I can't be Jay-Z, right? Say the rapper, okay? Uh, or I couldn't be um, uh, Steven Spielberg. Or I couldn't be uh, uh, Barack Obama, right? Mainly because I know my talents don't lie that way. But that's that's talents. That's a different thing to the essence of the person. Like I, I couldn't, I can't rap. Well, I've never tried, but I imagine I can't rap, uh, or I, say, I couldn't be a politician. I, my, I'm not drawn that way. It doesn't doesn't uh, do anything for me, so I couldn't be that person. But there's a difference between saying that and saying, oh, I could never be that good, or I could never be that wise, or I don't see any difference between me and Barack Obama, or me and the Dalai Lama, or me and Jay Z, or you know, fundamentally, we're, we're the same. I don't see anything different in them to me. Uh, and any, any, I haven't come across any spiritual masters or gurus or anybody like that uh, since I've become enlightened who is like that. Because when I became enlightened, as soon as I became enlightened, I could. It was that was one of the things that disappeared between me and Barry Long. It was like, oh well, we're about the same. Me and Catherine Ingram. Oh yeah, we're about the same. Any guru or person you can think of. Oh yeah, me. We're exactly the same. There's no difference. I don't see any difference between them. And I can tell you from here, whoever you are listening to this, there's no difference between me and you. So, um, um, if you are enjoying these podcasts, can you leave a review on on uh, iTunes? I discovered that you can actually leave a review for each episode. Um, and that really helps uh, get up in the rankings because um, not that it matters, you know, being up in the rankings, but it's kind of enjoyable. I get a kick out of it, the fact that it's, you know, I, when I look into iTunes and see how I'm doing, I can actually find me, you know, without having to search for my name. That's kind of good. And, um, and, it, and then the other side of it is if you think of what I'm saying is useful, well then, you know, I think if more people heard it, then that would be good too, wouldn't it? I know when I come across things that I like, like I just got a haircut and uh, my barber was telling me that he, um, he's he got a little Facebook page and he's got a little Twitter account. And as soon as I hear that, I kind of got onto my Twitter account and I just got a great haircut at the Dublin Barber. And um, that's just my nature is to sort of share the, if I come across something that's good. So I imagine that other people would feel like that too. If you do, great, leave a review. Uh, and then other people will know about it. And certainly, from my little perspective, the less gurus we have, in fact, if we got rid of all the gurus, um, that would be great. Or if all the gurus got down off the stage 
and sat down with the audience or all sat in a big circle or just said, look, can you all form a queue and I'll just, I'll just have a chat to you one-to-one. -one. I know it's very inefficient, but then um, maybe there'd be more and people would be saying they're enlightened and maybe that would make the world less um, harsh because I'm, I'm not, um, I'm not uh, pleased with all this harshness that's going on. It doesn't reflect me at all. I don't, I don't get it. What all this war, famine, greed, all this corporation thing is about—it's not good. So, yeah, if we can, if we can, uh, if you can, uh, uh, if we can stop that <coughs> or diminish it, well, that would be good, I think, because I would like the outside world to reflect me more, um, if that's possible. And if uh, you've got um, sweetness and goodness and uh, gentleness and kindness inside you, uh, which I'm sure you have, then. Um, wouldn't it be nice if the world was more like that and we didn't have to kind of go, oh, well, that's just life, isn't it? Life's shit. Life's hard. I mean, there's lots of hard things about life, but all the man-made stuff, can't we stop that? You know, like people um, people dying, hurricanes, through hurricanes or tsunamis or, you know, illness. That's all hard enough, isn't it? Can we not just, um, all the man-made stuff, We could we stop? We can stop that, can't we? I think we can, because it's just people. So all the, you know, killing all the animals unnecessarily, killing each other, uh, being greedy, having t having too m having too much stuff, and making everyone suffer. You know, that thing of I who did I hear? It? I can't remember who this quote is from, but I I, I think it's very true for me anyway. About, and it's um, what I want for myself, I want for everybody. What I want for myself, I want for everybody. I think it's very good, and it's a great. Um, I imagine everyone is the same. Um, I can't imagine somebody going, what I want for myself, I want for everybody. If you believe in scarcity, yeah, that's going to be a problem. Because it's like, well, there isn't enough for everybody, so I want my bit. I don't think scarcity is real. Uh, I think that's just a... It's like adding two and two and getting five and thinking for five is right. I think um, what I want for myself, I want for everybody. So... If you can leave a review on iTunes for the episodes that you like, that would be brilliant. And until the next time.